think I made my mistake when I tried to tell you about Skipper. That's where I made my mistake. Maggie. Uh, I never should have confessed. Maggie, now you shut up about Skipper. I mean it. You gotta shut up about Skipper. The laws of silence won't work about that. Not about Skipper and us. It, it, it's like locking the door on a fire in hopes of forgetting the house is. Hey, everybody! But not looking at a fire doesn't put it out. This time, I'm gonna finish. That night in the hotel room, Skipper and I. We... I don't want to hear about it. Why won't you face the truth just once about Skipper, about me, about yourself? Hey, everybody! Brig, honey! Are hey, you gonna bring that party up here or not? Kid and caboodle, son. That hey, won't do any that. good. Google, I'm gonna say this, and I don't care if it's in front of them. Maggie. Do you want me to hit you with this crutch? You're still blaming me for Skipper's death? Now, don't you know that I could kill you with this crutch? Good Lord, man, do you think I'd care if Skipper you and I had a friendship. Now, why won't you let it alone? It's got to be told. But I don't want to hear it. It's got to be told, and you never let me tell it. I love you, and that's worth fighting for. Not Skipper. Skipper was no good. Maggie. Maybe I'm no good either. Nobody's good. But Brick, Skipper is dead. And I'm alive. Maggie. Maggie, the cat is alive. I'm alive. Why are you afraid of the truth? Truth? <laughs> Little girl, somebody ought to teach you to knock before you open a door. Uh, otherwise, people might think that you're, you're lacking in good breeding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's Uncle Brick doing on the floor? I tried to kill your Aunt Maggie. Hello and welcome to Book vs. Movie. This is a podcast where we read books that have been adapted into movies and then we try to decide which we like better, the book or the movie. I am Margo P. of ColoniaBook.com and this is my good friend and co-host Margo D. of Brooklyn Fit Check. Hi, everyone. Happy Pride Month, everybody. Yes. Ah, very exciting. Um... We are we are deep in the throes of Pride uh, month month and a half actually I figured out this this year um, I figured out I didn't figure it out I saw it, <laughs> it was, um, usually we do it the first week of July here in San Diego but um, this year it's July fifteenth so it's like super extra long Pride for us yeah oh wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's so a big the deal here. Would have a real hard time in San Diego. <laughs> yeah, they're, 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 we may, we we might be. Uh, I don't know. We'll see how that plays out this year. <laughs> a thing that has um, existed all of our lives, by the way. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. Oh, no kidding. Um, but uh, because it's Pride Month, we are looking at uh, books and movies from LGBTQIA creators. And uh, we are going to be talking about a classic. I cannot believe we have never talked about Cat on a Hot Tin Roof before, but it is true. We have not. We have not. Um, if you are new and you saw the title of this podcast and you were like, I, I thought that was a play. It is a play, although I will say is a play that was developed from a short story. When the pandemic started, um, we made a commitment to do a brand new episode every single week. Here we are three years later, <laughs> still churning them out. Um, but in order to do that, we had to be able to um, expand what we mean by the word book. So we're not always doing the Joy Luck Club uh, or, or, you know, we can't do Les Miserables in a week. Um Anything that could also be a books, uh, a doorstop, uh, uh, we really can't consider. But we will consider really any uh, movie that's been adapted from any kind of literary source, whether it is a play or a magazine article or a short story or novella, a song, a poem. poem. Um, yeah, as long as it is a literary source, we will consider it. So we are constantly looking for suggestions. We've gotten some really great ones from our listenership. Um, and there's a few places where you can meet other listeners if you are new. You can interact with us on the internet. I guess the place we're most interactive is on Facebook. We do have a basic Facebook page, and all the episodes are posted there first, but we're really much more interactive in our Facebook group. It's a group that's private. You have to ask to join, but we really do only talk about books and movies there, lots of classic movie stuff, and then we have a couple of pins posted at the top. One is for the episodes we've done so far, which Thaddeus put together, thank God, and then we have one that for all the suggestions people have, and it's fine to like pin a suggestion or to go back to it. We also 
also ask that the movie has to be on a major streaming app. It can't be a DVD that we have to buy because it'll just never happen. Uh, you can also reach out to us on Twitter and Instagram. Both of those places were at Book Versus and Movie. We post more clips and images there. And then we just have an old timey email, book versus movie podcast. Spell that all out at gmail.com. You can send us your suggestions. You can also ask for stickers. We have a stack of stickers here. So if you'd like one, just uh, send me your address. And wherever you are in the place of the earth, one of us will send out those stickers to you. And if you really enjoy the show and would like to help keep us in books and movies, you can also support us on Patreon. Yes, we have P A T R E O N. We've been doing the show for 10 years now. And we have just literally hundreds of episodes up there from of our very early stuff, which is actually free if you want to really scroll along. But we've decided to take everything from 2020 and then previous to that is up on that Facebook wall, on the, excuse me, Patreon wall. So there's over 130 episodes that are free right now. But we recently put up Harold and Maude, His Girl Friday, Little Women, The Ghost of Mrs. Muir, The Perfect Storm is coming up, Stand By Me, The Phantom of the Opera, Stepford Wives, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, and Turn of the Screw. Yes, we've done so many shows. And they are all now on Patreon or will soon be, but they are no longer available in the main feed. And this just helps us get books and movies to, to actually talk about but also the hosting costs of putting the show together which we're thrilled to do where it's just the two of us we're not part of a big network and that's how we like it anyway fortunately thaddeus uh, one of our listeners put together a, a comprehensive list yes <laughs> of all of our sometimes i forget somebody recently on the in the group suggested um love story and i was like oh that's a great idea oh wait a minute we just... and i had to i literally had to check his list to read to remind myself if we had done it or not. I have to go to the Dropbox we, folder on my phone. It's been many years. Yes. <laughs> and by many, um, maybe even three. Like, because of COVID is just its I own know. thing. Yeah. Seriously. Um, so we have talked about Tennessee Williams before when we talked about um, Streetcar. I don't remember if that was last year. It was recently. Mm -hmm. Um but for those who are new, maybe you're not familiar with Tennessee Williams, he is not, um, well, we should just say that uh, during, I would say right after World War II, there was like a real, I think part of, as part of it being the WPA and all of that, um, there was a, an amazing kind of renaissance in American theater and it really developed, I think, partly because of the war in American, the pervasiveness of American culture. Um, it really developed a, a tremendous uh, kind of renaissance right after World War II and, and really experimenting with the form and with um, American stories in a way that uh, was really unusual for the time, but also kind of went away for, a, it took a long time for us to get back around to the diversity of stories, the um, the themes that were being explored. Uh, it was really a, a fascinating time. And, and one of the most um, hailed, you know, when we think of, of, playwrights at the time you think of like Eugene O'Neill you think of like Arthur Miller um but Tennessee Williams was arguably the one of the, maybe the most successful the most well-known um of these of this kind of echelon of American playwrights that were working at that time and um just he was one of these guys who who seemed to have hit after hit after hit. He was super prolific. Um, so some of not everything was a hit. There's a lot of stuff that we haven't heard of that, um, you know, flopped. But um, but the the he does, like when you look at his body of work. Whoa. Yeah. There's some really like really serious hits in there. <laughs> we should also mention it was for veterans after World War II, mm -hmm. they had a, you know, you could go to any school you wanted. You had a, bu a budget of funds that were given to you. And so many of them went into acting school. And so the acting becomes very different. These are all men and, and f or people who are family members of, of men and women who served, who learned about these new experiences that they had overseas. And that completely was uh, made a difference in the type of acting people did in the late 40s into the 50s there's this big swing into more naturalism and realism and it's a very interesting time but he so i should should i just begin with our bio of uh once again 
this is someone people spend their entire careers. <laughs> Seriously, we're not um, we're not drama scholars. <laughs> <laughs> or or know, film scholars even right fine art are scholars yes lay people yeah not not devoting we vote, devoted a week of research <laughs> right right episode. we're so tennessee his name was thomas lanier williams he was born 1911 in columbus mississippi he grew up in a very tough household his dad was a door-to-door salesman when tennessee was either five or six he developed diphtheria and was sick for a year. And he, his, it's his mother, like really coddled him and had, you know, cause he was home with her all the time. She had two other siblings. He had a younger sibling. Her name is Rachel. I believe she was not, her name is Laura basically in the glass menagerie, but he had a younger sister Rose. I'm sorry. And she had mental health issues, very severe mental health issues. He had an older brother who was a little bit more, I guess, you know, your ideal At the time of the macho son, the father was very rough and an alcoholic. He abused Tennessee. He was very abusive towards his wife. They moved a lot. He was incredibly shy and awkward. And he kind of found himself with writing. That was the one thing that helped him express himself because he was very tortured by a lot of different feelings and not the least of which being a sexuality which some people say like was so traumatic for him and other people's like nah it wasn't you know that wasn't it it was more of just how people reacted to him at the time what uh, some of his plays glass menagerie streetcar name and desire cat in a hot tim rip sweet bird of youth the night of the iguana he's won the pulitzer prize he's the american theater hall of fame if you go to his wikipedia page just the number of things that he's he's written is unbelievable and the things that he went back the rose tattoo and camino royale there's just so many and the things that he went back to rewrite because he had to make changes like he did with this particular work that we're talking about today he lived to be 71 he died by accidental drug overdose um and he left his money to his brother and his sister his sister was in a hospital in northern uh like westchester area of new york it was about, worth about $7 million. It was able, she had to get a lobotomy. She, they gave her a lobotomy in the 40s. So he left this money for her, but he also left money to the school that he graduated from, University of Iowa. And he died in 1983 at the age of 71. And though he wanted to be buried at sea and made very specific you know, instructions for this, his brother buried him in the Calvary Cemetery in St. Louis, Missouri. And that's our person today he based like Margot said he based it on two short stories and they were called three it, it was a short story called the three players of a summer game and it had right and it had some Rick of our and Maggie yes yeah did you read it no I didn't did you yeah I read it uh, it's very good okay <laughs> it's good. a really good short story um it's the very different it's it's different than streetcar um so in the but we have um brick and and maggie brick is in the in the story uh the original story three was it three players of a summer game you said is yes. that that's is that what it's called um so the three player the three players in the title are brick who is he in this story he owns the plantation already um, he owns the plantation. He is an alcoholic. Um, he is married to Maggie. He's such an alcoholic that she has taken power of attorney. And so she is really running things. But the way that Brick and Maggie are described in this story is almost ex- exactly as the way they're described in the play. So Brick was a was an athlete. He's still very good looking, even though he's an alcoholic and has been for some time. Um, but in the story, um, the family, their family doctor. So the, the it, it, Brick's uh, family is not in this story apart from Maggie at all. He did, They don't have any kids, um, but they are married. And in the story, um, the family doctor, uh, whose name I'm, is escaping me, it's not Im- that important, but the, the family doctor who has been kind of looking after, sort of looking after Brick um, through his alcoholism and various little injuries that he's incurred as a result of it, the doctor dies suddenly of it seems like a brain tumor or a an aneurysm like or something like that wow um 
he dies he dies very well suddenly he he goes from being perfectly normal doctor to he's speaking nonsense like he thinks he's like well, somebody's having a stroke almost kind of thing um and he's 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 they're trying to figure out what's wrong with him and it, anyway he it's very quick that he dies and um brick uh Brick, I think, is there when the doctor dies, I believe. And he he is in shock, as is the doctor's now widow um, in shock. And they be, develop a relationship together. So he's so the, the doctor's widow becomes Brick's mistress. And the three people playing the summer game are Brick and the mistress, the widow's, the doctor's widow, and the doctor's little girl that he's left behind as well. And the little girl in the story, um, Tennessee Williams is telling the story as though it's a memory of his childhood. Um, I think he's staying with a relative and the widow and the daughter live next door and he kind of plays with the daughter from time to time. And so he's been over the course of the summer, he's been observing this comings and goings. And so he observes the ambulance coming to take the doctor away. He observes Brick coming over every now and again. And Brick will come over and uh, plays croquet. These are the, That's the summer game. He plays croquet with the widow and the daughter. And they're playing croquet. And then it becomes really evident to everybody that they th- these two are having an affair. And meanwhile, Maggie is running everything. She's 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 the businesswoman running stuff around town and brick uh gets really drunk and he pretends to be um oh oh i'm sorry so through the course of the relationship that he's having with with the widow of the doctor um he starts like uh making improvements around her house because the house is very run down and shabby he has it painted. He has it fixed up. He has, you know, he's he's starting to, like, give her gifts and stuff like that. And everybody is seeing that the house is suddenly very nice and and um, and that Brick is paying for everything because Brick shows up and he's supervising the workers. So anyway, one afternoon, Brick is extremely drunk and he's pretending to be playing football or running track, something like that. He's talking like to imaginary people on the lawn of the widow's house his mistress's house and everybody is seeing what's going on and he injures himself. Oh my goodness. And um, so similar to the start of the play, he injures himself. And so he now can't walk for a little while. And so he's home. He's home now with Maggie for a while. And um, that becomes the end of his relationship with his mistress. So, so the mistress and the daughter continue to like set up the croquet game like expecting mr brick to come and the daughter who's friends who's friends with little tennessee williams in the story um the daughter and it's hot it's summertime right the daughter starts saying to the to the her her mom because everything happens outside because it's so freaking hot that everybody lives their whole lives outside during these months right so the daughter says to her mom that he you know is over her to say to the mom like oh you know uh mommy i love you know what i love i love ice and sugar and the mom's like what and she's like yeah i love ice and sugar you know when mr when mr brick finishes his drinks i like to have the ice and sugar that's at the bottom oh and the no mom is like, Whoa, no you're not doing that and she's like no but it's good and she's like no but you know there's liquor in that and she's like no no there's not any left when mr brick is done there isn't any liquor left um and but anyway, they're waiting for him to come and they keep expecting him to come. And he doesn't show up. And the widow is becoming like increasingly irritable and cranky. And then one day. I'll just spoiler alert, by the way, we spoil everything <laughs> yeah, yeah, in this yeah. podcast. Um, spoiler alert. One day, um, a, a man in a truck pulls up to the house and she thinks, oh, Brick has sent like another repairman. And the guy gets out and he ta- he's attacking a for sale sign in front <gasps> of the house. And what has happened is Maggie has bought the house and is selling it out from under Brick's mistress. And the end of the story is that um, then everybody in town sees Maggie then like for the rest of the year. So then eventually the, so the daughter and the mistress have to go, they have to move away. And Maggie um, is seen 
driving Brick. So Brick can't drive because he's gotten too many DUIs, basically. Um, and so Maggie has just, the rest of that summer, the rest of that year, everybody sees Maggie driving Brick's car around with Brick just drunk and rolling around in the back seat, basically. And that is, we're to just to deduce from that, like, that's how their life is going to be now. Like, he's just going to be drunk all the time and she's just going to be running everything. And interesting. Th- that's, that's the relationship that they're stuck in now. So it's nothing about, there's no, um, there are no gay characters in the original story. No, no themes like that of any kind. It is all just about, um, uh, heterosexual uh, relationships and um, many of the same themes, but w- within a completely heterosexual um, well, uh, milieu. Um, it's so interesting, that story, though. Yeah, Let it was a really good because, um Obviously, the writing's very good. It was in The New Yorker. Right. Oh, I got to look that up. One of his mm-hmm. first relationships with men, he actually did have some girlfriends. He, mm-hmm. was very, he said later on he was very slow when it came to romantic relationships, like it was in his twenties before he started dating. And then for first had sex, he first had sex with women. And then he met Kip Kiernan in Provincetown, who was this Canadian draft dodger who (laughs) came to America to avoid the Canadian draft. And they met on Long Island and they fell in love. And Kip was, that wasn't his real name, but he, that's the name he went by. And he, they had this very intense, you know, vacation relationship. And I've been to Provincetown. It's lovely. And it's, I can imagine people falling in love there. They, he breaks up with him by saying, look, I have to marry a girl. I have to marry this woman. It's just the way it's going to be. And Tennessee was completely destroyed, but he let him go. And then that guy wound up dying either of a brain aneurysm or a brain tumor. And it was very young when it happened. And it was very sudden. So I wonder if that was a part of it. It, you know, it could be. And and the thing I think Tennessee Williams has a number of relationships and, and a number of long term relationships, mm-hmm. and they all seem to be quite turbulent, independent of the very real, you know, conflict of that they are trying to just be themselves in a world where being themselves is completely illegal and vilified and and so on um he he also has a lot of relationships that are violent where there's a lot of he drinks you know and um a lot of the the same kind of turbulent problems that exist in any kind of relationship um with those kind of issues at play uh let alone like i said the, the the overlay of of the fact that you're gay um but yeah, he so he's familiar, I guess, with these kinds of tropes and themes and, and also his parents, you know, it's, it, but he's such a great um, I, he's it sounds like he's starting to write from a very young age, mm-hmm. you know, and he's just one of these people we've talked about, like like a Truman Capote um, who has just that astute writer's eye and a devotion to the craft of writing. Um, and, and so that everything is everything that he produces, whether it's a hit or not, is, you know, you can't say it's not well written. Right, right. And he <laughs> but, works you know, very hard. Yeah. This yeah, little story in The New Yorker, everything. it's it's not a long story, but he tells such a complex um he paints such a complex picture of these different players in this relationship dynamic. I mean, it's very complicated, but he does it like with this really, um, just, you can, you're just there. He just paint, you know, that just these little key phrases and, and turns of expressions that he uses, like the thing about the sugar in the ice, you know, um, that really just give you such a, as a reader, such a complete world that you're in. I bet that kid took some great naps that her mother was grateful for. I'm sure. Like not even knowing. <laughs> <I know>. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. But this, this particular play, um, did you watch that Mike Wallace interview that he did? No, uh, I oh, watched it's really good. I'll, okay. I'll put it in the Facebook group. It's it's it sounds like somebody like they've remastered it with AI or something because it sounds a little it's a little weird, um, but but it's it's somewhat restored. But there's a uh, it's an interview that he's done and it's right when um, 
Streetcar, the movie is, a, I'm not Streetcar, I'm sorry, this movie. Um, what's this movie? Cat on a Hot Tin <laughs> Roof. Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. I'm stuck between the two other movies. So sorry. Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, the movie is just about to come out, I think. And so it's it had already been a hit on stage. Um, the Rose Tattoo had already, he just kind of just finished a, a run um, of the Rose Tattoo. And he was embarking on a run of um, something that at the time was called Garden District or the Garden District, something like that. And Garden District was, I think, if I understand correctly, two one-act plays, one of which was Suddenly Last Summer, uh, which is eventually developed also into a movie, mm-hmm. um, also with Elizabeth Taylor. And it's bananas. And that's the... Yeah, that was, I love that movie. Yeah, <laughs> but um, so Mike Wall. So anyway, what I'm saying is this is this is at a point where Tennessee Williams is extremely successful. He's had a couple of flops, um, but flops by Tennessee Williams standards, like hits for anybody else, but a flop for him. And um, and he also has, you know, firmly established his voice in the American theater. Um, he's had several works where he's explored things like homosexuality and whatnot. And so Mike Wallace is asking him about it. And, and it's a really frank conversation about, about homosexuality, which I am trying to remember how he, how he describes it. I don't think he uses the word perversion, although that was the word that was used Mm -hmm. very much at the time. It was described as an anomaly, as a, uh, an illness sometimes, you know, We've we've talked about it before. And we've in a number of of works, but it is a really interesting conversation that he's having with Tennessee Williams. And Tennessee Williams is, I don't know if he's completely sober, <laughs> um, but he is uh, he is answering. It seems to be rather honestly about like why he explores what he explores in his work, why it's interesting to him. Um, he talks about he asks Mike Wallace asks him, like, why are you so basically like, why are you so obsessed with death? Why are your why is death such a big theme in all of your works? Which it kind of is basically like, why is your work such a bummer kind of thing? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and Tennessee Williams was like, well, I think I have a lot of humor in my work, which he does. I mean, he's a lot of humor. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of laugh moments, especially in this script. And, you know, he's basically like, well, death is a thing that everybody deals with. Like, why wouldn't I talk about it kind of thing? Uh, the other uh, element of that interview that is hilarious is Mike Wallace um, at several points in the interview turns to the camera and does a commercial for Parliament cigarettes. <laughs> He like takes a long drag on the server and is like, oh, yeah, (laughs) "Mm, that smooth, smooth taste of a parliament, you know, like journalists do. Like they do. Um, We talked about Mike Wallace when we talked about, oh, what was the movie we did? It was Russell Crowe. And they, uh, oh, oh. The Insider, right? Was that the what Insider, was, yes. Which is based the on a insider. magazine article, by the way. But Mike Wallace was somebody that like, oh, I'm a journalist and blah, 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 blah. And he started as a game show host. And if you see his interviews with women sometimes, they're just, oh. I mean, he's just, yeah, he, he's a piece yeah. of work. Let's just. He's a man of his time. <laughs> uh, very much a man of his time at the time. Uh, we should. Truman Capote and and Tennessee Williams were friends, frenemies. They were frenemies. I think is a good way of putting it. Yeah. Yes, they were very competitive with one another. Well, I have mm-hmm. a show on Broadway. Well, I have a show down the street from you, and it's got the New York Times review. Well, I mm-hmm. got this. You know, I'm going to do this interview on television. Well, I'm going to do that. It- it reminds me, remember when we talked about um, Elton John's bio and the, oh, yeah. the movie and the, how Elton John and um, Rod, Rod Stewart. Stewart have that competitive relationship and they like, they, they uh, take waste no opportunity to rag the other one about. Yes. <laughs> like, and, and Freddie Mercury was oh, also in that so group. Sorry about your last album. <laughs> yes, exactly. Mine had oh, yeah, three but- hits on it, and I my video won the Video Music Award. What does yours do? Like it's yeah, it's very that. Which I very guess is that it's fun to have competition. It's fun to have yeah. like work, you know, be around people who inspire you and make you work harder and make you want to do your best work. We should go into this uh, this play, which it's he's rewriting it. He approaches yeah. Let me ask you this yes. before we get into that part of it, because he did he this is something like he revisited and added and revisited and subtracted. And 
And I feel like the script that I read for this week was a very late version yeah, that definitely had the revisions. I was going to ask you, like, have, I don't know that I've ever read the original, it's, original, like as it was originally produced. There's some. So he created he wanted Ilya Kazan to direct it because that's where they have success together. And Kazan had his choice of projects at the time. And he was very complicated man. We've talked about him a few times, but he was, you can't, I have his, his book on directing. Like I'm constantly referring to it because he was brilliant. He knew how to take material and shape it. He loved to work with actors. He was a good collaborator with other people and he took this project and they, t so the story in the original form was much more like cat, the sorry, Maggie, the cat. And I, I sent you the clip from 1976, Robert Wagner and Natalie Wood. I remember watching, was it on television? Because I was. remember seeing it in the 70s. It's a, uh, yeah, yeah. And it was funny because I said to her, it's like bad captioning. There's a point where Robert Wagner says, do you want to be a lone maggot? <laughs> Just. So if you were saying maggot the cat, so I have to not say maggot the cat. It's Maggie the cat. Maggie in the short story, as I could, you're telling me, very feisty and kind of mean. The Maggie here, so because and I was just reading about Kazan. He said she needs to be more likable. We need to root for her more. We need to see her more as somebody who should be in charge, and people should look at yeah. her and like put her in charge versus when she comes in in yeah. charge, which makes yes. sense to me. That it up. does make sense. And that is not really how she's written. And you could you can read it in the script very much like the Maggie in the story. Yeah. Who is just like a machine who is just do, taking care of all the business. Yeah. There's a, I mean, I, can I see that there's a lot to be said. And he he Williams lived many lives in his lifetime. There's some stuff here that just like it shocks me to my core. Seriously, how his writing is so beautiful and the things his characters say so floral and so over the top and you can make fun of it like with your, but he sometimes she says things like she tells brick, you know, I was born poor. I had to have everything was a hand me down. Mm -hmm. You can be young and poor. You cannot be old and poor. And that yeah. is a truth like beyond truths. Like that is, mm -hmm. and she knows like you're so brick is Paul in the story. It's Ben Gazar. I'm sorry. In the original play. And I have a clip that I just posted. Did you see that amazing video of he is just Electric. The opening night of Canada Hot Tin Roof, seated in front, opening night is Tennessee Williams, Kazan, Lee Strasberg, Cheryl Crawford, and I don't know who. I was so nervous. I said, Jesus, I better be good. Well, we blew them away. We got such a reaction. There was a big fancy part, the fanciest thing I've ever been invited to. And at my table, Tennessee's here, Kazan is here. I'll never forget the newspapers came. The New York Times appeared and Kazan opened it up. And what a review. What a review. I'm not giving you any excuse to divorce me for, for being unfaithful or anything else. Maggie, I wouldn't divorce you for being unfaithful or anything else. Don't you know that? Or hell, I'd be so relieved to know you found yourself a lover. Well, I'm taking no chances. No. I'd rather stay on this hot tin roof. Maggie, a hot tin roof's an uncomfortable place to stay on. Yes. But I can stay on it just as long as I have to. You could leave me, Maggie. There's no reason why, why we can't have a child when, whenever we want one. Are you listening? Are you listening to me? Yes, I hear you, Maggie. But how in hell on earth do you expect to have a child by a man that can't stand you? What a review we all got. Jesus Christ. And what Bush Atkinson said about me. You couldn't buy it. Burl Lives cried. He had tears in his eyes. So did Barbara Bill Gettys. And I think we all cried. I was Whoa, so was he good in that on role? another show I work on called Dorking Out. We talked about Roadhouse, and he was the thug, the heavy in Roadhouse. 
<laughs> so that's right. That's so I just have him on Road my brain. House. Yes, Roadhouse, <laughs> where he fights with a spear in the end with Patrick Swayze. <laughs> it's fabulous. But so here he was. A, he was a serious stage actor, very handsome. He's. It's 1954, and he and Barbara Belgetti's. I guess they did one production where they created it for news crews, and it's the only. We don't have any. This is a which is what is shocking and a terrible thing is we don't have any films of these plays from the 40s, 50s, 60s. They didn't they just take the time exist. to do it. They didn't no. have the they money. They did do them. Yeah, they didn't have the money. It wasn't something that people thought was worth preserving on film because they, I think it was partly too that, as we said, like the theater was, the American theater at this at this point um, is a, highly respected i mean it is the highest of yes. high culture respected all over the world and so to film it like you would a movie or a tv show is sort of like cheapening it and so yeah and so um i can see why like they didn't necessarily think oh we must make sure to preserve this on film or kinetoscope or whatever uh why would you do that you know and um there are sometimes radio adaptations where they right. bring in the original and we have radio, which is something at least. But in this this terrible quality, though, you know, yeah. kinetoscope or whatever it was. But like, nevertheless, Ben Gazzara is just I can't even imagine what it must have been like to be in the theater. It is so just in this dumb, terrible video clip. Yeah. It is so powerful it's just chilling it's amazing he's so he's with barbara belgetti so i will always be miss ellie from dallas for me and the one from vertigo and she's vertigo, the, of the course. girlfriend and girl in vertigo so she's yeah. maggie the cat so they have this just one very quick scene and like i said i posted in the facebook group and i posted it instagram and tiktok and it's so but maggie is she's a woman that's in her early 30s she's married to brick Brick is around the same age as she is. He was a hero. His dad was wealthy. He's never had to want anything. He's good looking. He has a ton of friends. Everything kind of comes easily for him. He has an older brother with an unfortunate ne neck name, nickname excuse me, of Gooper or Brother Man. These names, this is also Tennessee Williams. He loves a, he loves a fun name. He... <laughs> He loves a good Southern nickname. He really, he <laughs> revels in that stuff. So Maggie and Brick, they're at the house of Big Daddy, so Brick's father. And Brick's father's 65, and he's having his 65th birthday. Big Goop, a brother man and sister wife, sister woman May, his wife, are with their five kids with the sixth one on the way. Hot afternoon in the Delta, which is just broiling. And Big Daddy is told by his doctor like oh you just have a spastic cold it hasn't been feeling well and they're all concerned about him and it's funny because it's burl ives who's a very burly man like you wouldn't look at him and think anything's He's a, wrong yeah, he was the original <laughs> big daddy yeah you know the thing about burl ives just a little sidebar about burl ives uh, of course you and i remember him from the christmas um uh, silver and gold and um Yes, we know him Holly as a Jolly Christmas, Christmas uh, Holly Jolly Christmas singing uh, animated snowman. Um, he, you know, he was somebody who was very well known as a folk singer. Um, he is somebody like he's like a big he lived a, kind of a long time, you know, and a, a big guy his whole life. He was never not a big guy. Right. A uh, very big, imposing figure who sang like fun little yes. <laughs> folk songs. Um, and he was a he, he was a contemporary and friend and I think often collaborator with people like Pete Seeger. Um, but uh, like Ilya Kazan um, and some others, he, during the communist scare, uh, Burl Ives was one of the people who, quote unquote, named names, went before the committee. And, you know, I, I, it's a complicated issue because these people were really under threat. Um on a lot of levels and um, and very often the argument is that when they did name names, they were naming names that were already known, mm -hmm. you know, they were just, but it, yeah. So anyway, um, it caused a rift between 
um, himself and it, it cost him a lot of his like folk singer cred for a long time. But then yeah. eventually he he pretty much regained it. I mean, he really um, he was somebody who was extremely progressive and um, even radical, some would say, um, in his politics. And um, but um, but he really, you know, he really took a, a big hit um both by coming under scrutiny of the House of American Activities um, and then by speaking before them. So um, so what I'm saying is at this time when he's making this play, like he's he's a, a controversial choice, let's say, for this role, um, certainly for the movie, if not for the stage version as well. But who on earth, who else would you ever get to play this role. Orson Welles is the only other person I could think of. At He's the time. He plays the, that role in the, uh, what is it, The Long Hot Summer? Yes. Um, right? Um, but uh, uh, he's just... He's so imposing, and he is Big Daddy. Like, what else would you call him? Right. He's big in every sense. He's just a large man. He also is just a big personality and he just takes over a room. You could say he maybe sucks the oxygen out of a room. He like has yeah. that much power about him. But mm-hmm. he's he comes back from the doctors and he's told you have a spastic colon. You're fine. Just, you know, watch the greasy foods or whatever they're telling him to. So he comes home all like the cock of the walk like I'm fine. Mm-hmm. I just have a spastic colon. Here. Yeah. So guess what? <laughs> so I'm not going to let you mother. I'm not going to let you walk. You know, he yells at his wife. He yells at the grandchildren. He yells at everybody. He yells yeah. at everybody. The only one he doesn't yell at is Maggie because he's hot for Maggie because Maggie's a babe. And Maggie really wants to please him because Maggie also wants the money. She's been poor her whole life. This is her shot. This is her chance. Back then, women couldn't get credit cards. Women couldn't. Yeah. I feel like this is a theme we don't talk about very much in this play because there's so many other like really big themes going on. Um all the family dynamic, um, of course, the the, hom- the homosexual theme of that's going on, the homosexual uh, subplot that's going on, but also like there's this whole something I learned, and I may have brought this up before, so forgive me if I'm repeating myself, but you know, I was an interior designer for like 20 years, and I worked with, uh, or arguably for <laughs> people who were stratospherically wealthy people, people like big daddy. I've known a few of them, uh, over my, over my life. And, um, and I've also known a lot of people like Maggie and a lot of people like the brother man and sister woman. I was, I was want to call her sister wife. Uh, yes, brother man I know nowadays. But something I learned, I observed, uh, early on was that when you, marry for money you get money you don't really get much else you, you know? don't get respect You're not good. you don't get respect you don't get love you don't get a uh, culture or a class necessarily um you get money and so um you know maggie maggie has i always feel like maggie is, is somebody who married for money um does she really love brick i'm not really sure she married for money, um, but she was only expecting to get money. But now that is under threat. So she's going to fight like a cat on a hot tin roof to get the, you know, we had an agreement. I was going to get this one thing and your behavior is keeping me from getting the one thing that we agreed on. So the gloves are off. Let's go. Yeah. Um, and the same thing with... Um, with uh what do you call the the brother cooper and uh and what's may cooper may. And may the 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 sister the in-laws um same thing you know she has she has married they have lived their whole lives in pursuit of money they have lived their whole lives with the idea that he's going to take the job that the dad that big daddy wants they're going to have the number of kids that big daddy wants they're going to be married for the length of time that big daddy wants um and it's all in service of getting that money Nobody respects them. Nobody even likes them. Nobody no. likes the kids. You know, the kids so, are annoying. Um, by the way, These the are... kids are really super. They're written and they're written annoying. Which yeah, is so which awesome. is great. The no neck monsters um, that she calls them. So I, that's a theme. I feel like we don't talk about very much with this uh, piece, although it is a big theme. I think. Um, 
but uh, because there are just it's just because there are so many amazing awesome themes in this in this piece there's th- there's that, symbolism uh, take the stage the, the symbolism, symbolism. When, she's, when his crutch breaks um the, the so, animals mentioned and the all this stuff is symbolism. Yes. Should, but i mean once again i want to just to say like look she grew up poor but she also had family that had money at one time yes. and she makes a point of saying we gave up the slaves at certain time before everybody else she does trying to bring up her bona fides like they're w- amazing people even though they're surrounded mm-hmm. by servants and what was the past for those servants but her currency is her, it's her youth and her beauty and mm-hmm. her sex appeal like those are the things mm-hmm. that she has going for her it's a finite thing and she's like she nailed the guys she wanted she happens to be very attracted to him and she likes the life that he could give her so she's fighting for that i think yeah. she loves him as well as she can love anybody i, I think she, oh, true yeah, as I, much as she can love anybody. Yeah, I. Yeah, you know she's. But this is the situation. But she's not. I was going to say she's not longing for a child because she wants somebody to love. Oh no, she's longing. She's longing for the stability, the financial stability that it's a child will just get. Just the means the financial, to the end. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If they never had kids, she'd be fine. I'm sure because they have all those other kids that could be aunts and uncles too. But that's not how Big Daddy wants it. Big Daddy wants a grandson. For I'm sure it was a, a granddaughter, maybe, but definitely wants a grandson. Brick. In the play, it specifically says a grandson. Right. Yeah. And that's the South. Yeah. That's like, you know, that's how you pass along your wealth. So what I'm trying to say is I don't know, like, there's a lot of differences between the play and the movie. And we've talked about this before that for decades, you could get away with doing things and talking about things on stage that you could never, ever, ever put on celluloid. Um, so that alone means that we have to do a lot of rewriting and a lot of um, hinting at in the movie versus the play. But I also don't know, like, what if some of these different things were added later? So, well, I so don't know. The thing was, so he said, so Ilya Kazan said, we need to make her nicer and we need to have Big Daddy come back in the third act because he used to be dropped off in the second act when he finds out he does have, spoiler, he does have cancer. He doesn't know this. They're all telling him he doesn't. And they're, that's why they're all fighting so hard on his birthday to get his attention because they don't know how much longer he's going to be coherent. He, so th- they bring that in there. The whole relationship, and this is like the crux of things, and this is another big spoiler, but that Brick's best friend 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 was skipper they were football buddies and they could have graduated from college gotten married and been in business whatever but they were both so they love football so much they started their own minor league team and they started touring with that but then they were getting beaten everywhere they went they were losing money and skipper and uh so she's Maggie's feeling like left out of this relationship because all Skipper and Brick, Skipper and Brick, they're like frickin' frack. They're attached at the hip. He doesn't. So she, Brick and sorry, Skipper and Maggie at one point sleep with each other. They have sex, and she explains, "Look, we both just wanted your attention. We both kind of wanted you, but you were." He was drunk. He's starting to drink heavily, and he's and. So Skipper, she basically convinces Skipper that he's in love with Brick and he should tell him. And she's thinking if he does, Brick will freak out and cut off the relationship. And then she and can then just Skipper move. will be finally be out of our lives. Right. Yeah. She doesn't yeah. count on the fact that Brick calls him, tells him. And uh, I'm sorry, Skipper calls him, tells Brick. And then Brick kind of is like, oh, I don't know how to handle this. Maybe you're drunk. I don't know. And Skipper dies by suicide. And so this sends Brick into a huge depression because he's like, on the one hand, he's just like, this was my best friend. And he feels responsible. He feels responsible, but he also realizes, like, I really loved this person. What does that mean about me? Tennessee Williams himself, by the way, I've read three different things. (laughs) And he says something different every time. Sometimes he says Brick is bisexual. Sometimes he says Brick is definitely heterosexual. Sometimes he says Brick was homosexual, but just in this one occasion. It's interesting and also because when he starts to talk about it with his father, his father is like, well, what was it? Because his father's being very open. Okay, like, let's talk about yes. this. So in the play, um, and, and by the way, I think you could play, certainly Brick could be played in either, any one of those avenues, right? Yeah. It, it could, it, it, it who work. knows? Um, 
in the play, at least in the version that you and I read, um, Big Daddy is at no point is Big Daddy like, well, no son of mine's going to be a queer. Da, da, da. And they use words like queer in, in the script. Um, Big Daddy's like super. OK. Uh, super there for brick and just reach in like listen i'm i'm here for you just you know you don't have to go through this by yourself and you know i let me help you and not let me help you not be gay let me help you accept yourself let me help you right love yourself for who you are i mean it's a very very different kind of um dynamic and and this is a a, a massive um difference between the book and the movie that i mean the play and the movie um and again they could never have written it like this for the film so i totally get it and i think the way they handle it in the film is is good yes. very good and effective and and accomplishes a lot of the same thing but um in the movie if you all are familiar with this amazing movie um there's this beautiful um this beautiful scene where um, Brick and Burl, Burl Ives and, um, oh my gosh, by the way, how funny was that explaining Cat on a Hot Tin Roof for Northerners? Video? <laughs> you should post on the Facebook group, did you? Oh, we've got to. It, it, may, it made me laugh out loud so hard I had to go back and watch it again. So funny. But anyway, Brick and Big Daddy are down in the basement. Big Daddy at this point knows that he's got cancer and that he's dying. They have this massive fight. They're shaking this whole plantation to the core. And um, and Big Daddy starts talking about his own father, who in this version, his own father was a vagrant, this tramp that took him around everywhere. Right. And they, they, he really loved his father um, more than he's ever loved anybody else in his life. And his father had absolutely nothing. And he's then he's made his life all about possessions. The play is totally different. Yeah. <laughs> In the play, um, Big Daddy is the one who is the hobo and the tramp and is he's got nobody. And he is starving, basically. And um, you know, super young man, he's starving, he's he's hopping trains to go from place to place just to try to get by and try to survive. And he lands on this very rundown plantation that is run by a gay couple. And the gay couple take him in, give him a job, put a roof over his head. They take care of him and they love him. They are his family that, you know, we talk about chosen family. Mm -hmm. They are his, cho they have chosen each other. This is a chosen family here and they help him advance. You know, he starts as a field hand. They, I'm afraid the N word is in the script. Yes. Um, you know, this is the time there we're in a, we're on a cotton plantation in Mississippi. So this kind of thing is going to come up. He, you know, advances and advances and advances. And when this couple, and he talks about how these two men truly loved each other and how one of them, the first one dies, the second one stops eating and and also dies and he you know he re truly he has nothing negative to say about the nature of their relationship or anything whatsoever nothing but absolute respect and love for these two men and so he's trying to explain right. this to brick like listen i get it i understand how these kinds of relationships can happen basically I believe also and I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I also think in that it's starting in the beginning of his story, I if I'm my memory's clear, I've read so mm -hmm. many versions, I've seen so many versions, <laughs> know, right? right? But he also at one point says, when I was a hobo, I was in a train car and you'd see two guys like laying next to each other. And yes. That's just he does what it was. Say that. And it's like. And he does hint that he himself participated in something like that. Yeah. Um, Wherever you can find a warm body also, sometimes, it's like where you find mm -hmm. comfort and that's Okay. And also we learn that the bedroom that Brick and Maggie have been in, that was the couple's bedroom. That was these two men. That was their bedroom um, that they shared as a couple. And um, so, yeah, so the, the nature of that confrontation between Big Daddy and Brick is totally different. Um, you know, Big Daddy is extremely understand. And he's they've written it as as compact. They've written it as well as they can close to this you know as they could in the movie i feel and they did a good job but um but he is very explicitly saying to his son in very concrete terms listen i totally get it let me be here for you you know i want to help you 
the way that this couple helped me and and loved me like a son and took me in. Let me help you, my actual son. Um, that I love more very... than anybody else in my life, by the way, yes. including his wife and his grandchildren and his other son. He yeah. Th- Brick in the movie, it. it's about how Big Daddy can't it loves expresses well, yeah, how well, he his feelings through you know and it's not like that at all in the play he gen you never for a moment you doubt that he loves his wife you doubt that he loves his other son he certainly you don't certainly doubt that he loves his grandkids but right you do not doubt that he loves brick all right folks so i have a cat on my desk right now who's uh, just touched the recorder and we stopped recording so we're going to recap just a little bit at the end of the play and then we'll go right into this movie you're a naughty naughty cat so the ending of this movie is and we should mention also by the way I forgot to mention is that uh, the words disgusted and mendacity come in these are very big themes one means lying one means like is he ashamed of himself is he ashamed of Right. So at the very end of the movie, Big Daddy, excuse me, the play we're talking about, Big Daddy does find out that he is, in fact, dying. Big Mama has a flip out. Everybody's now trying to get in on him. And he resigns. Basically, he's going to die peacefully, that he's going to leave everything to Brick and Maggie. And this is because Maggie tells him, just so you know, I'm pregnant. And she's wearing a silk gown and he touches her belly and he goes, oh, I could tell you really are. We're going to have a child. And then she takes Brick up to the bedroom and she throws the bottles away of all of his alcohol and basically says, I've been getting my, this is in the play, I've been taking my temperature. I know exactly what's going on here. I'm going to, I will tell you, um, this is the time to get pregnant. So this is when we're going to do it. And so then she says to Brick as she's like preparing, she says, look. Just so you know, I really love you very, very much. I love you. And then Brick says to her, wouldn't that be funny if it were true? Which is a great last line. I don't know why we had to cut that line from the I movie. but don't either. It would have been great. It really makes sense. It's the, it's the actual essential truth. All right. So we've talked about the play. The 1958 trailer. I was saying to you now off the air this was my dad was 18 when this movie came out and it was like a big thrill for him to be able to see because it was so risque for people <laughs> to see elizabeth taylor in a, tight, Ooh, in a tight slip, slip. i feel all the time like a cat on a hot tin roof then jump off the roof maggie jump off it the tennessee williams pulitzer prize winning play unfolds with a shocking impact and uncompromising realism that makes its author the most talked about dramatist of our day. Elizabeth Taylor is Maggie the Cat, a girl too hungry for love to care how she goes about getting it. I don't mind making a fool of myself over you. Well, I mind. I feel embarrassed for you. Feel embarrassed? But I can't live on this way. Now, you agreed to accept that condition. I know I did, but I can't, I can't. Paul Newman vividly plays the emotionally tormented football hero. But how in hell on earth do you imagine you're going to have a child by a man who cannot stand you? Burl Ives is a sensation portraying Big Daddy. I'm going to pick me a choice woman and I'm going to smother her in minks and choke her with diamonds. Judith Anderson plays Big Mama. When a marriage goes on the rocks, the rocks are there. Right there. Jack Carson gives vigor and color to the role of Gooper, the older brother. I don't give a damn whether Big Daddy likes me or don't like me. As far as I'm going to see this place run into the ground by a drunken ex-football hero. You shut up about my husband. You shut up. Madeline Sherwood portrays Sister Woman, the role she created in the play. Cat on a Hot Tin Roof is the passionate story of the conflict between people. You and Skipper and millions like you living in a kid's world. Playing games, touchdowns, no worries, no responsibilities. An intimate, revealing story of the conflict within people. Maggie! Maggie, the cat is alive! I'm alive! Hey, 
Hayes Code. And the Hayes Code uh, said sex, you'd have to have like two bed, separate beds. You couldn't show this. You couldn't say that. So there's words that we can't say that are said in the play that they can't say here. The ending is a bit more upbeat, but we'll go into it. It's Richard Brooks is the director, and he co-wrote the ad- adaptation with James Poe. But if you love the play and you love the language of it, they definitely use it all over in this movie. I think they do. I think on the whole, it's a, it's a very good adaptation considering the constraints that they were under, you know, they do so much with subtext and um, yeah, I think it's well done. So we have Elizabeth Taylor. We have Paul Newman, Burl Ives, Jack Carson, who was in Mildred Pierce. He's so good. And underrated by yes. the way is a sister woman who was she was also in the original broadway she was um as was for alive yeah um madeline sherwood who is so we, i mean we, i've met this woman so many times in my life we all know this woman we've all met this woman at some point in our lives I hope you don't have one in your family. <laughs> but she's just like, oh, she's just, and she's just relentless. Brilliant, brilliant. Everybody in this is so good, including the kids. I have to say, you know, I used to think, because Elizabeth Taylor in the 80s, she became more of like a person on television, like a media personality. And she was also an AIDS advocate. But uh, we also had people who posted on her Facebook group. She had a very famous commercial for Diamonds. That had like the kind of light These that I have on me right me now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like a very flattering light. That's that's. It was great. It was a great commercial. And uh, Paul Newman. I mean, please, this is peak Newman. Oh, he's so hot in this movie. It was supposed to be James Dean, right? Yes. He, there was a lot of tragedy. So he, there was supposed to be James Dean, whom Elizabeth Taylor had been uh, in Giant with. Um, I love both of the, I love Giant. Um, yeah. Again, a very long. <laughs> That's a really long. There's a few of the That's East of Eden. Long. I mean, why, my God. Yeah. yeah. But uh, and I forget who was who they were looking at for Elizabeth Taylor's role. But in any case, her husband, uh, Mike Todd, had just died when they're making this. And yet it is such a beautiful work of art, this movie. I, I've been so disgustingly poor all my life. That's the truth, Brick. Have you, Maggie? You, you don't know what it's like to have to suck up to people you can't stand just because they have money? You don't know what it's like? Never having any clothes? That dress I married you in was, was a hand-me-down from a snotty rich cousin I hated. You can be young without money. You can't be old without it. Where did I fail you? Where did I make my mistake? Make that your last drink until after the party, please, honey. So we have Elizabeth Taylor, Paul Newman, and there we meet them. Paul Newman has the crutch. And that's the whole thing with Brick is he's like constantly holding that crutch. He just broke his. We open yeah. with him breaking the ankle. We actually see I like that. that. We see that. I kind of, I kind of like that choice. Well, we expand beyond the bedroom. So yeah. in no, most in, productions, they take place in the bedroom only. Yeah. In the play, you know, if you're seeing it in the, at the time when somebody would have been seeing it cold and not knowing anything about it, you'd be like, oh, why? Wow, how did he break his leg? With the, and sort of, it sort of unfolds as the, the play goes on. But I like that we get right away who this guy is he's drunk he's like clearly too old to be on the football track you know uh trying to jump hurdles like what are you doing dude right seriously what are you doing dude he's drunk that's what he's doing and he he just we realized that just recently his best friend um skipper died by suicide he's moping around the house he's it's hot Everyone's miserable. Big Daddy's coming home for his 65th birthday. He doesn't want to be there. He doesn't care. And they're all around this table having dinner, and these kids are just monsters. <laughs> they're so... They're so annoying. Annoying. They're so terrible. 
It uh, must have been so much fun for those kids oh, to I like just get to be it. as loud and obnoxious. And, Jesus wants me for a son, babe. <laughs> <laughs> It's yeah, exactly. They're saying, and so she they throw at her nylons, her some food at her nylons. So she's got to run upstairs. She's killing herself to make big. And it's funny. Also, they show a scene where Big Daddy arrives by private plane, and so Goober's family, Goober's family is all. They put a band together. They're singing, and they're and he just walks out, rolls his eyes, and like walks right to Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> you know, he's like goodbye. She's driving me. So you get the idea that Maggie's very sexy. Men are attracted to Maggie. Because it's Elizabeth Taylor, by the way, because she's so freaking beautiful. Like, she is so smoking hot in it's every single ridiculous. frame of this movie. These people. It's, it's a little distracting. It, both of even, them. And when they're together, yeah. it's like, what is going on here? Like, why are they yelling at each other? You're both so beautiful. What is happening? But he's upset because he misses Skipper. He thinks all of this is trash. He doesn't care about it. He was a TV reporter, but he's drinking himself out of that job. She's telling him, look, they have 2,800 acres here that, you know, this is this is our future. This is it. And he kind of like, eh, okay, whatever. They do have the big conversation where he goes to the basement with Brick. And it, like Margaret was saying in the movie, it's a long scene, but it's it's really very, very moving the way he speaks with Brick. And they're trying to get around what the topic is, which is the homosexuality, which you can't mention. It's the 50s. Simply notice that you don't call me Big Daddy anymore. Now, if you needed a Big Daddy, why didn't you come to me? You wanted somebody to lean on? Why, Skipper? Why not me? I'm your father. I'm Big Daddy me. Why didn't you come to your kin folks of people that love you? You don't know what love means to you. It's just another four-letter word. Oh, you got a mighty short memory. What was there that you wanted that I didn't buy for you? You can't that? buy love. You bought yourself a million dollars worth of junk. Look at it. Does it love you? Who do you think I bought it for me? It's yours. The place, the money, every rotten thing is yours. I don't want things. Well, we, we drew this up. I say, we drew this up with the advice and assistance of the board of directors. Get out. Get out of my way. It's not fine. I don't want to see it. It's sort of a plan, a, a preliminary. And I like that just like in the play, you know, Big Daddy, who is macho, you know, masculinity embodied, right? Right. He isn't ever, he always, just like in the play, although he's being more oblique with his language, um, he is genuinely trying to help his son. He really is. He's not, he doesn't have the best tools. No. But he, he does care and he is trying to help. He may not be able to help, but he wants to help. And he's really trying to listen. Like, just tell me, just actually, you can tell me I'm not going to, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to do out. anything but try and help you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and in the play, Big Daddy talks about taking the mother shopping and how she buys everything. And he just finds her completely annoying in every way. Here, everything she buys is in the basement and we actually see it. So they talk about it in the play, but in the movie, we see it. So when Paul Newman is looking around, he sees money, but he's also like, it's wasted. Like, they don't care about it. They just bought the stuff just to buy it. And he's like, I don't want to be like this. I don't want this kind of life. In the meantime, Elizabeth Taylor does want that life. She wants that money and she's like we gotta you know tick tock we gotta show that we're gonna have a family together we're, they're not gonna leave us anything in the meantime they have a reverend come by and they have a doctor come by and this is for the the birthday celebration and every once in a while there's big clouds of thunder and that like a big 
revelation happens and you hear the thunder. Oh, my God. The reverend's there and he's there to just kind of like smooth things along. But the doctor comes and tells the family, you know, I don't know how to tell you this, but this man, they all know he's dying, but daddy doesn't think he's dying. Brick right. by accident tells his dad. Then. Yes. I don't know why you, did, you didn't tell the, the, the protocol was not to tell the patient right. um, what they had, but to tell the family um, so they can prepare but um, yeah, so the, the the idea is that we're going to keep the idea for like, I don't know, 20 minutes is that we're going to keep this from Big Daddy and, you know, try to take care of things and make things as nice for him as possible. But that all, you know, like all of this family's attempts to do anything as a family, it all just just completely turns to poopy. <laughs> it turns totally to poopy. Yes, they don't completely falling apart. The the you know Brick tells him and then Brick realizes, oh, now I should have said that. And Big Daddy, who goes from walking around, swinging around like, that's right, I'm okay, just a spastic colon here, nothing to see, is like, oh, I'm dying. And he's truly like, well, what do I have to show for it? I And all, and, and his desperate thing is just to help his son, help Maggie. All are crumbling under this big pressure of everything that's happening. Gooper's trying to make his play for it. Gooper knows he's not loved. Gooper knows that, and that's why he became, by the way, he's, he's a lawyer. He does really well for himself. He lives in Memphis or Nashville. But he, you know, he did everything he can to get his father's attention. And Brick just literally gets drunk and falls all over the place. And his dad just cannot stop helping him. So I'm sure he feels a lot of pain from that and a lot of hurt. But he's also, Madeline Sherwood, my God, that hairdo that they have for her is so. It's so unflattering. Un. It is so unflattering. It's just, but that's May. Like she's, we're not supposed to feel sorry <sighs> for her. We're supposed to just be annoyed by her because she's so yeah. chirpy and loud. And then, and they're all trying to get the big secrets out and they're all trying to discredit Brick. But in the end, he, he really, he does really love him. Big Daddy uh, you know, defends Brick. And in the very last scene of the movie is the compromise they make is that Elizabeth Taylor and Paul Newman sort of de decide together, okay, we're going to have a baby. Because this is going to, it'll stick it to those guys and it'll also secure our future. It'll make Big Daddy happy. And maybe this will cure us. Maybe this. And so they make out, which is nice to watch. But Which is a great reason to have a kid. Yes. Sure. Yes. To get a plantation <laughs> and stick it to your relatives. <laughs> it's, they want to make Maggie's lie a truth. That's what they're, yeah. they're ending it with. <laughs> It's fantastic. It, it's so good. It's so the, well the done. The soundtrack is so good. The storm and the music and the the costumes are so awesome. Sister wife's like hideous maternity dress and and then the bed and that brass bed that only she sleeps in, that only Maggie sleeps in and uh, the whole thing. Now tell me, what are you disgusted with? Mendacity. You know what that is? It's lies and liars. Who's been lying to you, Maggie? Your wife been lying to you? No, not one lie, not one person, the whole thing. Know. What's the matter? You got a headache? No, 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 I'm just trying to... You're just trying to concentrate, but you can't, because your brain is soaked with liquor. Yeah. Wet brain! Mendacity. No, there's nothing What do you wrong know about that? Mendacity? No, I no. I could write a book on it. It's your sister calling from Memphis. To hell with her! Cooper, get out of there. Go on. Close the door after you. Mendacity. Look at all the lies that I got to put up with. Pretenses, hypocrisy. Pretended like I care for Big Mama. I haven't been able to stand that woman in 40 years. Church, it bores me. But I go, and all those swindling lodges and social clubs and money-grabbing auxiliaries that's, that's got me on the number one sucker list. Boy, I've lived with Mendacity. Now, why can't you live with it? You've got to live with it. There's, there's nothing to live with but mendacity. Is there? Oh, yes, sir. You can live with this. I just, I love this movie so much from start to finish. And I think, you know, uh, kudos to the, to the script for keeping as much of the messaging and themes as they possibly could under the circumstances. Yes. Um, and still telling a story that feels true to the source material. It's super good. And you do feel just like you do in the play, like you feel sympathy for Brick because he's struggling with his identity. But you're also like 
come on, to man. Get it you together. Had everything. Everything's been handed to you. Had. These are first world problems, Brick. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, uh, I just love everybody in this movie so much. I love the servants. They're just going about their business. They're just mm-hmm. keeping things, they are really keeping things running while this family is like screaming and shouting and shooting pop guns and, and breaking antiques and all of that. And the, meanwhile, like <laughs> the, wor- the, the workers are like actually keeping things going. Exactly. Keeping the money being made and all of that. I love the doctor. I love the deacon. I just, I am just, every moment of it is, is just gorgeous i love it love it i don't know but in terms of like book versus movie it's hard because no it's hard to say it really is i'm gonna tie it i'm gonna say tie it's a tie for me too also there have been so many productions of this because Mm -hmm. i can see why actors want to do this it's so Mm -hmm. there's so many themes it's so over the top it's a story we all such great dialogue yes that's how fun is that to say that stuff? You know, I'm Maggie, the, I'm Maggie the cat and I'm alive. Yeah. I saw um, the Jessica Lang version with Tommy yes. Lee. Yes. Tommy Lee Jones. Remember that? Yeah. Um, which was the one, there was one where, where sister woman was played by the one, the one who was the mom on that 70s show. Like how perfect was she? Oh, for that she role? would be perfect for that. Oh my goodness. Yeah, the one I saw, and the, these are on, all on YouTube. I found them. One was mm-hmm. with, like I said, with Robert Wagner and uh, and Adelie Wood, and whoo. <laughs> it was Robert Loren- Wagner is. Let's just say, yeah, he's he really wants to be Paul Newman. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> and and Paul Newman, Paul, and this is like an early Paul Newman was like sort of the unknown element in this for a lot of people like paul newman was not paul newman when when this movie comes out um and i'm going to go ahead and say it his accent it's it's a little it's a little dick van dyke and mary poppins like it is mm, where how are you from the same family as the rest of these people (laughs) mm, you don't really it comes and goes like it disappears a lot especially in words like maggie that he says a lot southern accent is like and and then it's like one removed from that even it's it's a very weird it's weird um it's weird yes Natalie Wood is wonderful and and that version like when I watch that version I'm like Maggie just get out of there like you can find another rich guy just go you're beautiful just get out of you're there beautiful get away from these people but that's the point like they can't get away easily and they and they all do love each other in a weird way it's family and it's chosen family versus your family and I I love it I can't I mean I'm gonna I'll get to pick a tie I know that's that's a weenie thing to do but it's just it's gotta be I just it's got you know and and also I think because it's um it is Burl Ives as the, the the central spoke of the you know the wheel in both of these versions that we're talking about the original Broadway and and um and the movie and I just, how do you, that's the one that whenever I see another production, I'm like, how can you not have Burl Ives? Yeah. I wish we could have Burl Ives every single production that ever existed of this play. Cause it's such, it's so him. I just love it. Yeah. Same. So speaking of classic um, Broadway shows that have been made into Hollywood movies from this era. Um, next we're going to be talking about the children's hour, which is going to be facing a lot of the same issues in terms of adapting from stage to screen. It's a much longer time in this case between the stage version and the screen version. Mm -hmm. Um, We'll be talking about Lillian Hellman, who we talked about not that long ago, but, but this is really a good one. And, and we've never, we've never talked about it before. And what, I forget what year is it the forties that this comes out in, on stage. Uh, let me see. I have it right in front of me. I'm suddenly drawing a blank. I'm just stuck on the movie. I love that movie. 1934. With, uh, oh, thirties even. 34. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So it's the children's hour that we're covering. And then the movie was with uh, Audrey Hepburn, Audrey Hepburn. Mm-hmm. and Shirley, Shirley MacLaine. MacLaine. And that comes out in the 60s, I believe. And James Gardner, right? James Gardner. Oh, is he? I, and, I don't know why. I'm not meaning to put a D in his last name. Um, but every time I can't say his name without a D slipping in there. It's G-A-R-N-E-R, right? Yes. <laughs> Gardner, like Gardner Rockford. Plays. 
Yeah, Rockford. The Rockford, Rockford Files. Yes. Love the Rockford Files. <laughs> Me too. All right, everyone. So that's going to be the next episode. Please thank you so much for listening. And sorry about my cat <laughs> interrupting. <laughs> sorry if we don't know what got cut out. I don't yeah. know. I'll, I'll figure it out. In the, in the, it'll all work <laughs> out in the wash, as they say. Uh, once again, please send us your suggestions. And you can find us at all those social media places that I mentioned at the top. And also, once again, our email, bookversusmoviepodcast at gmail.com. And Margo, where can they find you? You can find me online at coloniabook.com and all of my social media callouts are at She's Nacho Mama. And where can they find you? You can find me at Brooklyn Margo on Twitter. On Instagram, I'm at Brooklyn Fit Chick. You can see pictures of that cat that interrupted our show today. And at TikTok, I'm at Margo Donahue. All right, everybody, we'll be back soon with a new episode. Thank you so much for listening to the Book vs. Movie Podcast. We are a part of the Frolic Podcast Network. You can find more podcasts you will love at frolic.media forward slash podcasts. We follow the hashtags Lady Pod Squad and Potter and Family. If you want to support the show, you can go to our Patreon page, go to P-A-T-R-E-O-N and look for Book versus Movie Podcast. We have a basic Facebook page, but we also have a private Facebook group. Go to Facebook and type in Book vs. Movie Podcast group if you want to join that. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Book vs. Movie. Spell all those words out. If you'd like to send us an email, it's Book vs. Movie Podcast. Spell that all out at gmail.com. You can follow Margot D at Brooklyn Fit Chick on social media and Margot P at She's Nacho Mama. Thanks so much again for checking out our show, and we'll be back.